Uh, so it's a great pleasure today to welcome you at the uh, 2000, 20, uh, 2021 Ruth and Irving Adler Expository Lecture, uh, which will be held by Silvia Serfati today with the title From Superconductors to Coulomb Gases, Crystallization Questions. So uh, Silvia is a foremost expert in PDEs, the calculus of variations and mathematical physics, and she's well known for her works on Gibbs-Burlandau theory and the statistical mechanics of Coulomb type systems. She graduated in 1999 under the supervision of Fabrice Petuel at the Ecole Normale Supérieure and uh, University of Paris 11. I guess the French would say Paris Sud, right? After spending the early years of her career at the Ecole Normale Supérieure de Cachan as a CNRS researcher, she moved to the Courant Institute in 2001, where she's currently a silver professor. Uh, from 2008 to 2016, she was at the same time professor at the Université uh, Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris. She has, received, uh, she has received numerous prizes and honors. Uh, let me just mention that she's been both invited and plenary speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians and plenary speaker at the European Congress of Mathematics. She has been recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and she's the recipient of several prizes, the prize of the European Mathematical Society, the Henri Poincaré Prize uh, of the International Association of Mathematical Physics, just to mention two. Um, okay, so before leaving her the floor, let me also thank uh, our colleague, Professor Stephen Adler, whom we have in, in our audience today and who generously established in 1999 the Ruth and Irving Adler Expository Lecture in Mathematics to honor the contribution of his parents to mathematics and science education. Um, without further ado, please, Silvia, the word is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you all for the very kind invitation. I'm very honored and uh, I'm pleased actually to have the opportunity to um, a different, a slightly different exercise from what we usually do, which is to present uh, something accessible for a broad audience of non-mathematicians possibly. So I, I will try to uh, target it in, in that direction. Um, so I, I want to talk about forms that come from physics, but which um, uh, which involve interesting mathematical questions, of course. And, and let's start with a, a little bit of setting and motivation. So uh, we're going to start from superconductivity. Uh, superconductivity is a phenomenon that occurs in certain materials, certain metals and alloys. Uh, it was discovered in the beginning of the 20th century. And what happens in those uh, materials is that if you cool them below a certain critical temperature, suddenly they lose, they lose their resistivity and um, they can flow um, some currents without, uh, without uh, distance. And that those are called superconducting currents. And they are eventually explained at the level of quantum mechanics by the formation of Cooper pairs of electrons that, uh, that circulate. And so what this creates is the possibility of, um, of magnetic fields that also uh, are generated by these superconducting currents. And a very particular response if you uh, put your superconductor in an external magnetic field. And that has been called the Meissner effect. You see it here on the picture. It's a magnet levitating above a superconductor. So what happens is that uh, the, the, the magnetic field of the, of the magnet, of the external magnetic field, is repelled by the superconductor. It does not penetrate, and it creates this, um, this magnetic force that can levitate the, uh, the magnet here. And actually, uh, that's uh, the basis, if I understand correctly, of uh, technology for levitating trains, you know, that can uh, run very fast uh, in, in Japan, they use that. So we, we, we try to describe uh, this phenomenon and it turns out that it's a little bit more complicated. It depends on the, the type of superconductor, but in a certain type that's called type two superconductors, certain types of materials, uh, there is actually a critical field after which the magnetic field starts to penetrate. So below, below that critical field, you have this Meissner effect, full repulsion, expulsion of the magnetic field. But after a certain first critical field, magnetic field penetrates via some vortices, which are um, like, if you want, tubes uh, that, that, that 
are made of normal material surrounded by superconducting material. And, and around these normal phase regions, there is, there is a sort of superconducting current loop winding around it. Uh, and as you increase the applied magnetic field, you will get more and more of those superconducting, uh, of, sorry, of those uh, vortex mines, tubes. And it turns out that they also repel each other. So their number increases, but at the same time, they repel each other. So they organize themselves in a way to um, optimize these two uh, competing constraints. And what you see, so it, this is a, this is going to be a 2D picture. If you want, maybe a cross section or what happens in a in a thin film of superconductors, is you see that the vortices arrange themselves like this in beautiful triangular arrays. All right. So this in physics is called an Abrikozov lattice. It was first predicted by the physicist Abrikozov, got the Nobel Prize for this. And what Abrikozov did actually is he started from the model, the phenomenological model that had been proposed a little bit earlier by a famous physicist Landau and his uh, student, I think, Ginsburg. Uh, and they had proposed that you should describe the behavior of the magnetic field by a um, certain order parameter, psi, which is complex valued. And, the gauge of the magnetic field A and this energy function is functional. All right, so Abrikozov looked at, the, studied this functional and uh, predicted that you should see periodic things, that there should be some periodic solutions of this. And then it was observed experimentally. People looked for it and, and, and saw it. This is a beautiful uh, success of theory, right, and of prediction. Okay, so we, we would like to understand a little bit like how these abricots of lattices really appear. And this, this particular functional is a phenomenological uh, base uh, at the beginning, but then it was later justified from microscopic principles by the Bardeen Cooper Schrieffer uh, theory. So you don't have to really look at all the details in the, in the formula, but here we're in putting a parameter epsilon, which corresponds to a certain material uh, constant, and we can, which you can think of as being small, it represents, if you want, the landscape of the vortex cores of these little black dots uh, on this picture, right? How big these are is related to this epsilon. And as mathematicians, we like to caricature things and let this epsilon go to zero so that we really can see these things as points. Um, and people worked a lot on this functional, both of course from the physics literature, but also in the mathematical community. And what was collectively achieved is that you can prove that as epsilon goes to zero, when you have these vortices, and there are many of them, uh, they really interact in a Coulomb fashion. So they they behave as if uh, they were just charged particles with a logarithmic uh, interaction, which is the Coulomb interaction. So that brings me into the question of Coulomb interactions. Uh, so you know that Coulomb was the first to postulate that uh, the electrostatic interaction between charges uh, is governed uh, by a uh, by a potential that decays like one over the distance between the charges, right? And um, you can also now relate the electrostatic potential or electric potential to the distribution of charges, let's say call a charge density rho by uh, this Poisson equation minus Laplacian H rho equals rho. So I will use that later, call it mu sometimes. Um, and of course, this has a strong correlation with the question of Laplacian. So in fact, what the Coulomb interaction is, it's nothing else than the fundamental solution to the Laplacian. So I will denote it little w. It is the function, uh, radial function in, in all space that solves minus Laplacian w equals the Dirac delta mass at the origin. Okay, so 
by just convolving, if you want, with this uh, function w, you can solve Poisson's equation. So now, to summarize what happens for the Coulomb interaction, uh, what Coulomb has found in 3D is this, that the, the fundamental solution to Laplacian or the Coulomb kernel is one over the distance, but it depends on dimension. So if you're in dimension one, it should be minus the distance. In dimension two, it's very particular. It's minus log of the distance. And in dimension bigger than three, you can have this general formula, one over x to the power t minus two. This, this is what solves this equation, right? So we understand this as the Coulomb kernel. In every dimension, it's always, you know, it's always, well, dimension one is a bit particular. I would not want to consider it too much, but we'll be interested in two and higher. And you see that this interaction is always singular at the origin decay and, and repulsive and in dimensions three and above it decays, but not in dimension. Okay, so what were we interested in from superconductors? We were interested in a system with many particles, possibly these vortices, which interact with this uh, Coulomb interaction energy. So let's let's look at a model system like this. So we, we define this energy Hn to be um, the sum of W of Xi minus Xj. So I'm gonna look at all the distances between all pairs of points, and I'm going to compute the um, Coulomb interaction. Okay, but you have to do, look at distinct points because a point, if you make it interact with itself, it would be infinite and you don't want to consider that. Uh, so W is as above the Coulomb kernel, or sometimes uh, we can be interested in some mild generalizations of this, which is to consider either minus log of the distance in dimension one. So I would call the log, the log case or logarithmic case, dimensions one or two now. One is not Coulombic and two is Coulombic. Or general inverse powers of the distance, we'll call that the Reese case. Okay, so if this S here happens to be D minus two, it's Coulomb in dimensions three and higher. And if not, it's just another general decaying uh, interaction. So now what, what we've done here is we've added a confinement potential V. Uh, so you should think of V as something that grows at infinity sufficiently fast. And what it does is it forces the particles to stay somewhat confined because I'd say you want to minimize this energy um, because the uh, the interaction is always repulsive. The points prefer to be very far apart. So if you put n points together, there is no reason for them not to fly off for infinity at infinity, except if you put some sort of confinement. So the confinement is there to balance out the repulsion and to keep things in a bounded region. So you see uh, there is an n in front just to keep that of same order uh, as that of order n squared. Okay, so competition between, you know, things that want to be far from each other, but also that need to remain in a relatively unclosed um, area that remains unfined. And so the question is, how do you balance those two things? Of course, we would like to understand, let's say in the first step, uh, the behavior of minimizing. So ground states, if you want, like things that have the lowest energy uh, when N gets very large. You can actually um, generalize these types of questions a little bit. You can do it in a geometric setting. And people have been interested in that, um, in approximation theory in particular. So for instance, you can be on a manifold. If your manifold is closed, the advantage is that you don't have to worry about points fleeing to infinity. They have to stay there. Um, and so then you can just look at some of functions of the distances and here, uh, we write, for instance, the Reese interaction energy, so one over Xi minus Xj to some power. So again, the 
points we hurt each other and they have to stay. The manifold. And what's uh, one reason why it's interesting to consider general powers S, so one reason can be physical, but uh, also from a mathematical point of view is that it, it provides a whole one parameter family of problems, which connects on the one end the logarithmic energy, which mm. you as S being almost well, tending to zero, you can, you can view as, a, as, as, as approximating the logarithmic interaction. And on the other end, you can show that when S becomes very large and tends to infinity, this converges to the best packing problem. So you know, the best packing problem is take hard spheres like billiard balls and try to put as many of them as possible in a given volume. So this is a solution of the best packing problem in 2D um as you could guess or as you know uh, the best packing problem is not known to be solved except for a few dimensions and i will come back to that uh, a little bit later. Uh -huh. okay so again in the situation of a manifold um on the sphere for instance here is a picture so when you try to minimize with the logarithmic interaction so if you minimize minus sum of log of distances, it's actually the same as maximizing the product of distances. So people like to also write it like this. And this is, these are called Fikete points. And why are people interested in Fikete points? Because they provide a good way of um, sampling points on a, on a sphere here or on a manifold uh, for interpolation. For instance. Right? Let's say you, you want to distribute your points as evenly as, as possible on, on a surface. How do you do it? Well, it turns out that this seems to be a good criterion. And if you're interested in uh, approximation theory, for instance, which means um, approximating the integral of a function on the surface by uh, some of the values sampled at these points on average, that you can even prove that this is the best you can do. But, and so people are interested in understanding where those points go, how they distribute themselves. And this is a picture, right? So you see that obviously they go uniformly on the sphere. The distribution is very regular, very uniform. Um, and that's the sort of macroscopic distribution, we say, right? The macroscopic distribution eventually as n goes to infinity is uniform. But there is also a microscopic pattern that you can obviously see on this picture if you were to zoom, right? You have to look at the micro scale now. And you see things that actually resemble very much the abricots of lattice that we saw in superconductors. We see things that do want to um, look like triangular lattices, except that cannot really be the case everywhere because you couldn't quite tile your sphere for a couple of different reasons with, with a good triangular lattice. So you're gonna have to have defects. But anyway, so um, people do that, as I said, to find good configuration for interpolation, but also understand carbon molecules that go in soccer balls and things like that. And it turns out that if you look at the Reese interaction energy, regardless of the parameter S that you put, you'll see the same types of pictures on the sphere. Now, if you were to go on a manifold that's not the sphere, you get these nice pictures here on a, on a torus where the distance is really the, the, the distance in the Euclidean space of the embedded. So, so it's really the distance that you could measure um, naively on this, on this uh, donut. And you see the distributions of point depending on the value of S for the interaction. Well, there is actually something uh, pretty amusing, which is called the poppy seed bagel theorem for reasons that, uh, well, you can see here, that says that there is a critical S above which your distribution will uh, be uniform on the, on the bagel uh, and below which it's not, as you can see here. Uh, so that, that's actually not so hard to prove. So you get a uniform distribution. 
either on a subregion or on the whole thing. But then again, you get this microscopic distribution, which seems to have this nice uh, little regularity. Another reason to be interested in Coulomb gases, besides approximation theory, is um, is really physics and statistical and quantum physics. Um, and there, what you want to do is not just look at minimizers of the energy, but you want to sample configurations probabilistically, if you want, according to this Gibbs measure. So this is, if you don't know, this is the definition. You want to say that there is some temperature, so it's actually an inverse of the temperature is this parameter beta here. Uh, and the probability that you will observe the configuration in locations x1, xn is proportional to the exp exponential of minus beta times the energy. So configurations with low energy are favored, but other configurations are also possible. So you have a whole distribution of probability on the configuration. Okay, so with the same Coulomb type interaction, these things arise in quantum mechanics. You encounter them when you study the fractional quantum artifacts. Uh, this can also be seen as a toy model for matter and in particular for plasmas, where these points can be viewed as the, uh, the electrons in, uh, in the gas. And if you allow your points to carry uh, possibly negative charges, you know, like instead of being just plus guys, uh, positive charges that we got each other, you can have positive and negative charges. Now the positives will repel each other, the negatives also will repel each other, but between the positives and the negatives, you will have attraction. That's also called a Coulomb gas. Many people have been interested in. in that actually some in the audience uh, and relates to a theoretical physics models in which you see Kosterli's Tauler space transition. So some, some very uh, interesting and particular physics of this in dimension two. So many motivations from, from physics groups. Uh, one uh, particular that's uh, of interest to people also is uh, the motivation from random matrix theory. Um, okay, it turns out that people started studying random matrices. So you know what a matrix is. Right? So it's like something that represents a linear operation. Um, you can want to, you want to study the spectrum when you have a matrix and studying very large matrices is a sort of way of approximating uh, operators. And in quantum mechanics, you know that the spectra of atoms are represented as the, as the spectrum of, uh, of self-adjoint operators. So very large matrices are a good model if you want. And that was introduced by, uh, by physicists. And in particular, uh, Wigner and Tyson observed this phenomenon that uh, for the most basic random matrix models, then you can try to cook up the eigenvalues repel each other again like Coulomb particles. So you don't have to read all these, uh, all this text. It's not very important, but let me try to explain the specifics. So if you take a very large matrix and you want to make it random and you want to draw it like in the most um, neutral way as possible, you'll make the entries be Gaussian. That's a simple simplest distribution, and you'll draw them to the IIT, so completely independent Gaussian. Um, then you can compute the law of the eigenvalues. And you find that the eigenvalues interact logarithmically. They don't like to be too close to each other. They repel each other logarithmically, just like in one of these, uh, what's called a Coulomb gas. So this, types of, this type of uh, probability. If you impose some symmetry uh, on the matrix, then, then the eigenvalues have to lie on the real line and uh, it will be a logarithmic interaction on the line. Hence the interest for looking at logarithmic interactions in one. 
Okay, so if you don't uh, have the symmetry, then what you get is what's called the Ginebra ensemble. So the Ginebra ensemble is exactly what you get if we're in, your points are in dimension two. They represent the, the eigenvalues in the complex plane. If you take this beta to be two in my previous uh, formula, and if you take the interaction, um, sorry, the confinement uh, potential to be quadratic. And here is a sample, um, a plot of eigenvalues of, uh, of these types of Gini uh, random matrices. And you see that you know, the points are fairly uniformly distributed in the disk. That's the result of the effect of the repulsion combined with the confinement that keeps them together in that disk. Uh, it's a little bit shaky though. They don't seem to want to be too close to each other. Uh, hopefully you can believe that. Uh, and, and so this is a, a large um, segment of activity in the mathematical community as well as the theoretical physics community to understand random matrix models. Uh, and things like that. Okay, so now, I, as I told you, you have the repulsion between the points, you have something that keeps them together, and now you also have temperature, that's a new ingredient. So what is the effect of temperature? We had seen before that if you don't have temperature, if you're just thinking of minimizers, it seems that things want to be in triangular lattices. That was in dimension two, right? So let's look again at dimension two, but now with temperature. And you see, you can observe the effect of temperature and I'm going to uh, change by decreasing temperature. So you see the points distribute themselves in this sort of shaky way. And now we decrease temperature in the simulation. And you see the configuration start to get a little more, um, more ordered, I would say, until you really get to very low temperature, and maybe you believe that you can start to see a triangular lattice. All right, so we'll want to try to explain things like that if we have time. So, crystallization questions is these questions of excuse me, can, how we can see. go to the can you go please, to the last picture? This picture does it have five fold symmetry? I don't. Or is it? I just, don't know. I don't think so. It's only a numerical simulation, you know. So oh, it's, okay, it's only you. worse where it's worse. Huh? And the number of points probably oh. not large enough to start to see. The uh, problem is when you numerically simulate these things, you can get stuck in local minima. So you have no guarantee that you're going to. Okay. So crystallization questions. The questions of periodicity, like why do we see lattices? All right, so I had one slide here that has a lot of formulas. This is the slide with the most uh, formulae, but you can you know, ignore it uh, uh, happily. Uh, I just want to give you a, just a little hint as to why here Coulomb is important because we, we haven't really, uh, it hasn't be, been obvious from the previous discussion. You, know, you can have any repulsion you want, confinement, and that seems to have the right ingredients to create this uh, situation. So what we're going to use here is really this notion that the Coulomb kernel is the fundamental solution for the Laplacian. Uh, and so if you uh, think of the Coulomb potential or electrostatic potential, just like in Poisson's equation, you're solving uh, an elliptic equation, Laplacian minus Laplacian H equals your distribution of charges. So here I denoted it mu, and there's some constant, unimportant constant depending on dimension. And so uh, for those of you who are mathematically inclined in the audience, uh, you can rewrite, if you have a density of charges and you want to count the total interaction uh, between these charges, you can see you have to make a double integral. So, Right, w x minus y d mu of x d mu of y, which you can rewrite as a convolution of w and mu integrated against mu. Uh, but that's the same. You can recognize the same as the as the Coulomb potential h mu, because that's how it's defined. 
uh, it's, it's the integral of w of x minus y to the of y integrated against mu, which you can see again as the Laplacian up to a minus sign and some constant. So if, I, if you have h minus Laplacian h, you have this thing that's called Green's formula integration by parts that allows to rewrite this as an integral of gradient h squared. So in other words, the Coulomb interaction of the system can be written as a certain um, single integral in terms of the electric potential. So you start, you, you start from a system where you want to see everybody interacting with everybody everywhere. And you finish with actually a single integral where you have to count just the energy locally, but in terms of this uh, electric potential. And that's the sort of basic step, which is nothing uh, really fancy, but uh, for the analysis, which really uh, relies on the Coulomb nature of the interaction. You couldn't do that if uh, you didn't have this locality of the operator that's being solved here. Okay. It turns out these Ries kernels, at least some of them in some interval, you can also treat in, in a similar way, but that's a sort of lucky coincidence. So it's very rigid in terms of the kind of interaction that can be treated this way. Okay, so next I want to um, present you what can be said at the microscopic level, because you remember there was this macro scale and then there was this micro scale at which we expect to see these very nice patterns. So what we want to do is we want to blow up, we want to zoom uh, near points here, and we are going to see different, possibly different configurations of points that are zoomed. And when we let the number of points and to infinity, I, ideally, um, we see configurations that fill up the whole space. Right? And for these configurations, we're going to want to define a new interaction energy, a limit energy, which doesn't see n anymore, that just takes these infinite configurations of points and uh, counts their energy. So it's going to be denoted w. And it counts the total Coulomb energy of the system where you have these positive um, singular charges uh, together with a uniform, a uniform negative charged background of uh, say density minus one. So you imagine that there's a sort of negative charge that's completely uniformly spread in space and it sort of balances the positive charges. So on average it balances it up. So this is called a gelium in physics. And the definition of the energy that we take, um, I, I won't give you a completely precise definition, but it's based on this electrostatic potentials that were defined uh, here and here. It's based on this reformulation by single integral. So instead of having to count all the pair interactions, um, you, you just try to integrate this uh, gradient of the electric electrostatic potential and average it over larger and larger boxes. OK, so at the end of that story, what you can show rigorously is that if you start from minimizers of the original energy, when n goes to infinity, if you zoom them, uh, they converge to minimizers of this function w, which doesn't have n in it anymore. We also started from the Ginzburg-Landau uh, functional. You remember that complicated thing at the beginning? This thing worked from there let epsilon go to zero, take the vortices, look at what they do, and their number gets large, and this epsilon goes to zero. And in the end, you can prove also rigorously that uh, the, the patterns that the vortices form tend to minimize the same energy W. Okay, so we have a new object, this W, and we want to minimize it. So I didn't give you a complete formula for W, but I can give you one uh, if you happen to look at configurations, we have some periodicity. Uh, so what that means is, you know, if you have a, a box, you look at configurations of, you know, given number of points in the box, and then you just copy paste it ad infinitum, like just reproduce the same configuration. Then you can write a formula that's for those of you who may want to be 
interested in seeing something, seeing a formula. And here, this big G is the sort of new effective interaction of this system, but neutralized by the background. And it's just the Green's function of the underlying torus. So it has the same singularity at the origin, and it, you can compute it. You can express it as a series, actually, as an Eisenstein series. And you can even write a, an analog for recent interactions, uh, where at this time you don't have Laplacian here, but you have a fraction or Laplacian. OK, so now we're left with trying to minimize something like this. What are ground states looking like? And that is a crystallization question because we want to show um, that uh, maybe minimizers have some periodicity. Okay, so more generally, um, if you're given any interaction function big U, you can form the sum of U of Xi minus Xj. Maybe you put some sort of boundary condition or something. So you have an infinite system like that. Um, you want to minimize this thing. Maybe it doesn't always make sense because the, the sum is not finite. So rather you do it in a fixed size ball, you divide by the volume of the ball, and then you let the size of the ball tend to infinity. So you minimize the energy per unit volume. Right? But here you have to count all pairs of interactions between all pairs of points. Um, so the question is, when can we say that minimizers of things like that are lattices, that they form exact crystalline uh, configurations, what's called a brave lattice? So this is actually a very hard question. Um, there's very, very few cases in mathematics where you can show um, starting from nothing, that, that so something is periodic. Right? That's even very hard, except in one dimension. Uh, and it is uh, important because it explains, it would explain uh, the crystalline structure of matter, right? Explaining why uh, matter organizes itself in crystals it is a question of this type. You want to minimize a certain interaction energy and show that minimizers are. Uh, our, our lattices. So, as I said, there's very few positive results, questions like this, but let's look at a few. So there is the 2D sphere packing problem that I mentioned before. So it's like what we call hard spheres potential, the billiard balls that cannot overlap at all. Uh, the triangle lattice is the minimizer that's in 2D. In 3D, uh, well, I, I'll mention but there is some sort of variant of this that was proven um, by uh, Tile in 2006. If you have a sort of caricature Leonard Jones potential, so it's a potential that's like this as a function of the distance. So it really prefers a certain precise distance here. And otherwise, um, when particles are far, it doesn't count very much, and it really doesn't want things to get very close. So, so it's quite close to the hard sphere. Uh, then he can prove that still uh, this behavior persists, the triangular lattice is the minimizer. And it's, re it's, it's resting heavily on the proof by Radin of this uh, crystallization result. Uh, there is a honeycomb conjecture. That's kind of fun also. You want to minimize total perimeter among tilings by regions of equal area, and it turns out you can put a hexagon. Uh, that's a solution. So that's also a, a crystallization result in the sense that the, the answer, the minimizer, is periodic. There's the 3D sphere packing where you have your oranges in the marketplace, right, that are stacked up in layers of uh, triangular lattices, also solved by Hales. And then there is this uh, uh, very interesting and relevant for us, the Kuhn Kumar conjecture, which dates back, I think, to, I could have the date wrong, but 2009 or something. So, what that conjecture says is that there are three particular di dimensions for which you have a special lattice. So, in dimension two, uh, our favorite triangular lattice of Abrikozov that we've seen uh, before. 
In dimension eight, something called E8. And in dimension 24, something called a leech lattice that have uh, particularly nice properties in terms of the sizes of their uh, the vectors in that lattice, but whatever, which minimize uh, all interaction energies as soon as they are completely monotonic. So in the sense that's written here, you want the interaction to be a function of the square of the distance and the function has to um, be monotone in the sense that uh, the function is decreasing, the second derivative, sorry, the, the first derivative is negative, the second derivative is positive, the third is negative, etc. So you alternate sign. So typically uh, an, an inverse power that's, that's a kind of thing, but it could also be a Gaussian or things like that. Okay, so as long as you have monotonicity, a certain monotony of the interaction, these guys should be the best lattices. And that is very particular to these dimensions because as soon as you're in a different dimension, for example, dimension three, you can check with examples that the best possible lattice should depend on the interaction. It cannot be that there is one lattice that fits all interactions. It's only in those dimensions. It's not expected to hold in other dimensions. It's not like a limitation of their conjecture or what. It's just about for, it's just not true otherwise. Okay, this includes sphere packing. You can put it in the conjecture. Uh, and their conjecture was meant for a smooth, a smooth interaction. And what we're interested in these Coulomb interactions, they're not smooth, you know, at, at the origin they are singular. Uh, but you can show, and uh, uh, it was done with Mircea Petraki, that, that the cohen kumar conjecture would imply the same result for these uh, functions W that I define vaguely. So really for these Coulomb Ries types of uh, infinite interactions. Okay, so there is some good news now, which is that um, this cohen kumar conjecture has been proven in some cases. So first, uh, there was this breakthrough by Marina Vyazovska uh, two years ago, who showed that this E8 lattice solves the sphere packing problem in dimension eight. So she really introduced a new concept, new type of function that helps uh, make the proof work. And with that breakthrough, that opened the door to solving other cases and then Quickly, the sphere packing problem dimension 24 followed. Uh, and last year, uh, the full Kuhn Kumar conjecture, but only in dimensions 8 and 24. So that means for all interaction energies, and with the little uh, corollary I told you, even Coulomb or Reese or whatever, in dimensions 8 and 24, we have the answer of what the lattice looks like, um, what the minimizer is, and what the it's, it's, it's a lattice and it's this precise lattice. Unfortunately, um, it doesn't work for now in dimensions two, even though the conjecture is still positively true. Let me point out um, as a disclaimer, you may think, okay, there should, it should always be a lattice, right? These things want to distribute themselves very regularly. They repel each other. So why not go periodically uh, in all dimensions, right? But in fact, you can quickly see that in high enough dimension, it's not going to be lattices that win. Already for sphere packing, for instance, it's not the case. There are better uh, ways to pack spheres when you're in dimensions larger than, I don't know, like 10, 11, 12. Uh, because lattices, in a way, have too much void in them. So, so uh, it, it's a very uh, puzzling uh, thing that, that very smart people are picking up. Uh, but let's not think that uh, it's always lattices. This is a relatively low dimensional phenomenon. So we're back to the cases that are most uh, interesting for us for physics, in particular this Abrikozov lattice in dimension two. And we, are, we have to, to be stuck for now at this conjecture that uh, still the coin kumar conjecture in dimension two, right? The triangular lattice uh, should be a global minimizer of our energy W. Um, that, that belief really uh, fits the experiments or is, is 
meets the experiments because in superconductors, we observe these triangular lattices. On the other hand, I told you that you can start from the Ginzburg Landau functional of superconductivity, and you can derive rigorously that you have to minimize this W. Uh, so you tend to believe that uh, the experiment has found the minimizer over and over. And uh, so it's sort of proof by experiment. Okay, one partial result in case we want to check is we can compare lattices between themselves within their class, right? We can compare this triangular lattice which has equilateral triangles in there with other lattices in 2D such as the square lattice or rectangular lattice, like different shapes of lattices with fixed volume. And uh, at least a reassuring fact is that the triangular lattice is always the best. It turns out to be um, a relatively uh, direct consequence of a result from uh, 50s in number theory. This is all like a sort of number theory world here. Uh, that uh, is uh, about the minimization of the epsine zeta function among lattices of fixed volume. So the best is the triangular lattice. At least it discriminates, you know, it, it discriminates between a triangular lattice and a square lattice, which by the way, Abrikozov in his first uh, paper had predicted a square lattice, if I'm not mistaken. So he was slightly wrong. And the difference of the energy between the square and the triangle is not very large. And that was later, uh, later corrected. So uh, really what he had gone right is to predict it should be periodic. Uh, let me point out that if you want to now ask the, this question in dimension three or four, five, six, already uh, finding which lattice is the best within uh, the class of lattices of fixed volume, uh, even for this uh, zeta function or something like that, is uh, still an open question as far as uh, I've understood. So there's um, actually papers of uh, Peter Starnak and Storm Person and someone else as well. I talk about this and uh, if, I, if I understand correctly, only local minimizers are, are, are really identified. So uh, in dimension three for our Coulomb interaction, what we would believe is that this BCC body center cubic lattice would be uh, the analog of the triangular lattice in 2D. Uh, but that's uh, that's not obvious at all to, to prove. So there's different lattices in 3D that are natural candidates, right? You can have this BCC where you have the a cube and then you put another point in the center of the cube, but you also have FCC, which is face centered cubic lattice where you have a cube, but you put points on the centers of the faces. Uh, and these two are good candidates and it turns out that one of them should be the best for um, uh, interactions that decrease fast enough and the other one should be uh, the best for interactions that decrease rather slowly. So it really depends on the interaction. It's, it's against the universality of uh, Kona and Puma, I would say. So how are we doing? Fine. Um, that's all I want to say about crystallization. Uh, and now I'm going to use the last 10 minutes to give you a little bit of uh, flavor of what goes on with temperature, which is also quite interesting, uh, and maybe a little more math in there. But uh, you remember with temperature, we want to look at the Gibbs measure. So proportional to exponential minus beta times the energy, beta being an inverse temperature. And you, then you have this quantity Z, that's the normalization for this uh, probability density. It's called the partition function. And let me remind you what we saw in pictures, right? On the left-hand side, a relatively low temperature Coulomb gas in dimensions two, points well distributed in the disk. And on the right-hand side, a higher temperature, more shaky uh, configuration. And by the way, um, important open question is to get expansions for these free energies. So this Z that's here, you want to compute its log. It's natural to take the log because it has an exponential in it. And that's called the free energy. And uh, 
in the physics literature, there are some formulas about how this expands. So I wrote to you something in two dimensions. Uh, and these coefficients that, it, that are in front of these expansions as n gets large are very interesting to theoretical physicists and uh, they have geometric interpretations and if you want like quantum field theories interpretations uh, as far as I can understand. So uh, another type of motivation for these types of Okay, so with temperature, instead of seeing uh, rigid configurations, you know, infinite configurations that are deterministic, we're gonna we're gonna have random point configurations, right? That everything is going to be random, and so what that's called is a point process. It's a, it's a random point configuration. It's a law of point configurations. Uh, and so here on the left hand side is plotted the Poisson point process. What is the Poisson point process? It's like um, it's like raindrops falling on a piece of paper, right? The, each point falls uniformly at random in the piece of paper. It doesn't care that other points have been there near or what. The points don't interact. They don't feed each other at all. So that's the Poisson point process. On the right hand side, this is the process of points that you see from these random matrix model that I mentioned before, the Ginebra point process. Uh, so this is the, uh, the infinite volume limit of that, where you see the points don't like to be too close to each other. So it's, it's kind of more rigid, less independent than the left hand side uh, picture. So what we would like to do, in fact, is to extract such point processes at the end and to characterize their properties very precisely. Unfortunately, we don't know how to do that. And these are the only two point processes that we know how to identify in, in situations. Uh, the Gini point process being a very specific case because beta equals two and beta equals two. There's some sort of algebraic structure in there. It's a determinant of structure that allows you to compute things. And if you move away from beta equals two, you sort of lose uh, everything. So I'll give you a result that's valid for every beta. For all these log or risk interactions that I mentioned before, including uh, Coulomb. And, and that says that you have a sort of analog of the previous theorem about minimizers of the energy when you have temperature. The analog is that instead of minimizing W, that's just the bottom line, instead of minimizing W, you want to minimize a sum, it's like a free energy, an, an average of W with respect to your point process plus a relative entropy of the point process with respect to the Poisson point process. So now instead of just minimizing W, you have competition between energy and entropy, and it depends on beta. Okay, so entropy, if you don't know, um, saying that the entropy should be small is a way of saying that P should be like Poisson, should resemble Poisson in certain sense. Okay, so to caricature, if beta is very large, you can delete, when beta is infinite, you can delete the second term here. That corresponds to low temperature because beta is an inverse temperature. So at low temperature, you can neglect the entropy part and then you should just want to minimize W. What that means is, as we've seen before, in low dimension, so if, beta, if dimension is two, you expect triangular lattices. If dimensions is eight and 24, you don't not only expect, but you know you have lattices. And in all these other intermediate dimensions, maybe some lattices, maybe in large dimensions not, but okay, you get crystallization at least in dimensions one, eight, 24. When beta on the other hand is very small, that's the opposite temperature is very large. And then that's the only thing that matters, the entropy. And that means what that tells you is that the point process should resemble Poisson. So you, should just, you should just see things like this on the left-hand side. Okay, and in between, well, you have a competition now between W that seems to prefer things that are very rigid, at least in low temperature, and entropy, which seems to prefer things that are very independent and kind of shaky. 
And of course, we think that that explains these sort of intermediate behaviors here, like here, which is the sort of in between being a lattice and being completely Poisson. That's beta equals two, it's in between. And your cursor is the temperature. And so of course, as you, if you go back to the original uh, pictures where you see the temperature, you see like your entropy is more important. And then as you decrease temperature, it's the energy part of the competition that dominates and you see something uh, less and less shaky and more and more rigid. So we have some sort of mathematical uh, principle for that if you want, thanks to the team. Okay. Um, for those interested in the physics, there is uh, some puzzling conjectures in the physics literature or that are based on numerical observations where they see there should be some critical beta where a phase transition happens. And what they mean by phase transition is you should see um, a change, a, 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 an abrupt change in the way that correlation functions decay. So uh, in the way that uh, long range uh, effects are felt uh, in the system. So something around beta equals 175 in dimension two or something similar in dimension three, uh, they think that there is something going on. But from a mathematical point of view, we have no idea. And even in physics papers, it's mostly numerical. But very puzzling questions here uh, in dimensions two and three. And I will finish with a, a true mathematics math slide, uh, if you forgive me. Uh, just to tell you that we can extract some limiting object uh, in dimensions two, but now also a little bit in dimension three for the logarithmic interaction. Uh, when you have your distribution of points and you test it against uh, some regular enough test function F, so F is supposed to be just a way of measuring what's happening someplace in space. If you take the sum of f of xi's, where xi's are your points in your uh, configuration, and you subtract off a correct uh, average that I don't want to describe, you converge to a Gaussian distribution with an explicit mean and an explicit variant. Uh, and uh, in a more visual way, what that means is that if you look at the electric potential generated by your uh, configurations of points minus the right thing that's there to neutralize, uh, it converts to what's called a Gaussian free field. And a Gaussian free field is some object uh, plotted, simulated here on this beautiful picture, which if you want is a sort of, here you can see it as a sort of two dimensional analog of a Brownian motion picture. So it's just a surface instead. It has this very shaky, um, uh, irregular behavior that you may have seen in uh, uh, Brownian motion pictures. And that's a, that's a universal object arising in other models as well. Okay, so uh, 3 p.m. Um, to conclude, I, I hope I've convinced you that the analysis of, analysis of Coulomb systems, uh, while directly uh, linked to physics, obviously, is also at the crossroads of several branches of maths. Uh, it involves analysis, uh, some PDE even, probability, number, some number theory with those crystallization questions, a little bit of geometry if you want to do these things on manifolds. When you analyze the microscopic behavior of Coulomb systems, you're led to these crystallization questions and conjectures. You can also do that with temperature, and then you see this effect of competition between order and disorder. Uh, and also this Gaussian nature uh, for the fluctuations of this uh, electric potential. Uh, and, and many puzzles remain, as you have seen, and one of these uh, being that, after all, we still don't understand how much of this is specific to the Coulomb uh, or this interaction, and how much of it is even more universal than that. So it's time to stop. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sylvia, for the beautiful lecture. And um, let me open uh, the session of questions. And, and um, I, I actually uh, would like to start with one. So um, back to the free energy that you showed us before. 
um, and, and you showed us those constants in the expansions. So is there, is, are there guesses actually from the physics uh, literature or are there also uh, rigorous, rigorous results on uh, what those constants actually should be? Yes, so uh, this constant A here, that's easy and we can prove. The constant B beta, that's uh, mm -hmm. basically a consequence of uh, this theorem. So it's not written like that, but we can prove it with these types of ideas. And anything beyond uh, is not mathematically proved, but physicists have very nice formulas that can provide you with explicit formulas made with free field computation. So sort of pass integrals where at some certain points you jump a little bit uh, above the mathematical rigor, but you get a very nice formula. So uh, yes, we have uh, we have very intriguing conjectures, uh, but so far, no, no complete proof. And it's actually also related. If you, if you write this uh, question for the zero temperature state, it's related to a problem of Smail, uh, who wanted to compute the minimal energy on the sphere and uh, to give an expansion like this and also to provide an algorithm that computes minimizers in polynomial time. That's still an open problem. People are actively trying to pursue. Also very difficult. <laughs> now some questions? Yeah, sure. Please go ahead. Now, thanks for a wonderful lecture. Um, in the case of dimension, you said two uh, eight and 24 and two's got this very special thing that there's a technical reason that um, Vyasovska and Co can't deal with it. But you actually asking it for a specific problem, that's your W, your Coulomb potential. And uh, of course, there are many cases where you can prove like in, in the, the densest packing in the plane was done by Tua, I think first, it's an elementary problem. But they can't get it by their linear program method, this extreme linear program. So if you put your W into the linear program, this is my question. Their method actually tells you what's true to any number of decimal places that you want. So I wonder if you've asked them to run your linear program. Your W is a specific W or it's a family of Ws? In it's that a specific thing. The, the, uh, the problem is that you have the singularity. You have the singularity, so you have to reconstruct it as some sort of transform of exponentials. You have to uh -huh. write a superposition of Gaussians. Mm -hmm. That's how you prove it in the, in the yeah. reduction. Uh, uh, exactly. It's just that Kuma, I mean, Elkies and, uh, and Kuma <laughs> had ran this linear program. And uh, I'd just be curious. Uh, firstly, I didn't realize there were any problems that in dimension two, I always thought it was just a hiccup for them to give a proof of Tua's theorem directly, but you actually pointing out that there's some fundamental problems unsolved in dimension two, uh, which is very interesting. And I, I'm just saying, if you ask them, I'm sure they could run their linear program and uh, give you with, so like in dimension 24, even before uh, Vyasovska's work, one knew the density to 20 decimal places from the yeah. algorithm, from just running it machine-wise. Yeah. So I would be curious, I was just curious about that point. Yeah, uh, it's not. It's more common than a question. Sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah. No, I imagine that you can try to run it, and I'm sure it's going to be in good agreement with, <laughs> with, with the time. Yeah. <laughs> no sure. surprise. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, but but you know, I've, I've talked to them recently, and it seems like the there is a serious obstacle for dimension two. Like it's not. Uh, oh yeah, that, that's a technical it's issue. Really tried. With, like it's it's really tried, and apparently there's something. Uh, uh, so I think uh, you've convinced me that there's very good reason for them to sort this out in dimension two. I, I think so, because you know, dimension two is an important physical dimension. And, and of course, you can try to find another proof that doesn't rely on their approach. But that also people have tried and failed. So I think their approach is still the most promising thing that's around. Yep, thanks. Sylvia, you mentioned that um, uh, people are not expecting uh, uh, a regular lattice to be a solution in high enough dimension. Uh, uh, can you be a, be a bit more specific about that? So, so what, 
what is going on outside of the special dimensions that are like eight and 24? I mean, 24 is pretty big after all. So it can't be only the, the, the sides of the dimension, right? So there is a, yes, but it's like a jump. I think it, it's like after 11 or 12, it's not lattices except 24, which, which like is a reminder of, uh, of the low dimensions. But the, the simulations, uh, they talk about this jammed configuration, which, which packed more, you can pack more things, right? When you, when you don't uh, try to be a lattice. And in dimensions uh, 11, for instance, there are, there are counter examples where you take two lattices and you superimpose them on top of each other. And that, that decreases the energy during high enough dimension. But there's just not enough points sort of in a, in a lattice. So, so, so you mean it's actually rigorously proved that it cannot be a, a, a lattice because you can just take uh, uh, um... Yes, I think uh, this... so whenever I ask people in that area, they tell me, yeah, it's like a folklore knowledge. So, I, uh -huh. you know, maybe it's not exactly written in a complete proof, but everyone knows it's true and how you do it. Uh, I think it's in that book by uh, Conway and Slow. And I'm not sure. It's but there. Yeah, it's it, definitely. It's in yeah. Conway Slow. Yeah. yeah. So, so yes you can build but just for the function of Denson's packing not your other functions right mm -hmm. yes for Denson's packing but but you know that means that as if you take a Reese interaction and you make s large enough by sort of continuity you expect that at least for s large there's going to be some interaction that has some tails for which it's not true and but i think also for for Kuno, uh, so th there is a, actually this Princeton uh, colleague of yours, uh, Todd Poitou, right? uh, who does a lot of those simulations and, and studies of that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that, um, I, I understood it as, even, even for full interactions, it, it can't be true for all dimensions forever. It's hard for us to get an intuition on its large dimension. But um, at least you can't have the expectation that it's necessarily going to be that. And what do the simulations actually uh, suggest? Because, okay, so the, super, the superposition of two superposition of two lattices is still kind of, you know, sort of, anyway, you, you, you can think it has some regularity after all. Uh, yeah. So are they suggesting something like that is actually viable or is it really going to be something wild which doesn't have no, any it, type of... It's not wild, but it, it, they, they, they introduced this notion that they call hyper-uniformity, for instance. That's a, a notion where you still keep a lot of features of the, of the lattice. It's very uniform and you can see it in Fourier space. You can see it by the, by the trace of the, you know, the signature of the Fourier transform. And they try to prove that things are hyper uniform, and, but it's very hard. Um, and, and this, they study these jammed configurations. I, I don't fully, uh, yeah, I don't understand it all, but, but, but there is a sort of weaker notion, if you want. That's, mm -hmm. that's, that's more appropriate. In high dimensions, it's very interesting to theoretical computer scientists because that's um, putting balls in large dimensions, packing balls in large dimensions. That's that's how you do coding. Apparently. You want to be able to encode your signal only at the centers of, pick up only the centers of given balls. So it's it's, it's a very active topic of research. Yeah, Even my for large dimension is not physical. It's, uh, it's yeah, uh, hi, this is Tom. Uh, and my, my understanding is in high dimensions, one, one doesn't even have perhaps very good estimates on the sphere packing density, right? This is not, uh, this, is, this is what Tarquato tells me, tells me anyhow, he has ideas. And, and I think actually, the best ones are due to Schmidt and they're not that good, perhaps. No, no, uh, Akshay improved that. Where's Akshay? Yeah, Akshay. Ah, the world I'm record. Here. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. So what's, what's modest. the status? He's got the world record. Uh, yes, no, there's, there's, a, there's an exponential gap between 
the lower yeah. number bound. And it, it's so you, did it's, you get the exponent? Did you, did you change the exponent? Oh, no, no, no. You changed the power. Yeah, I, no, even worse. I'm not, to a, a very mildly improved Schmidt's result, but uh, I see we don't I see. have that. Uh, but yeah. actually, Sylvia, I wanted to ask a, a kind of um, physical. So I, I'm under the impression if you take iron, iron has a BCC crystal structure. And if you heat it up at some point, it switches to FCC. And then if you heat it up more, it switches back to BCC. And I wonder if, if you see any of these non-monotone phenomena in temperature um, from a theoretical point of view. Not with these types of interaction. I wouldn't expect that. Mm. I think it's a... Uh... I think it might be it might be related to non-monotone interactions, right? It's, it's, you take something like Leonard Jones, that's more realistic. It's not I see. It's not a monotone interaction. So then maybe that that could help explain things like that. I'm I'm not sure. I, I wouldn't expect something like that for these uh, monotone things. And actually, there, so there is a nice uh, survey paper by Blanc and Levin called uh, the crystallization conjecture, a survey where they do uh, numerics for all the um, zeta functions. And they, they test, you know, FCC, BCC, and, and you have two monotone curves and they cross. So there is just one given parameter for which is, that one's the best. Uh, so it's not uh, about temperature, but it's about interaction. It's it. But so it's, it's very monotone, there's no surprise. And I don't imagine that temperature changed the story very much there. Mm. But, you know, it's very speculative. <laughs> I wanted to make a comment about the temperature, about the phase transition. Uh, we know so little about it. I, I don't know whether a Merman-Wagner uh, theorem works in these cases. I suppose it doesn't because of the long range nature of the interaction. But we don't know, you know, usually in statistical mechanics at high temperature, we know things are very disordered and you have uh, exponential uh, rapidly decaying correlations. But uh, to my knowledge, there's almost no literature on that point, mathematical literature anyway. Do you know something about that? So the high temperature range. Uh, no, no, I, I haven't seen any paper on that. So the only paper I know on that, which, uh, which I guess I meant to look at is by John Imbry. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Yeah, that's true, that's true. So he, he, he does do the beta tends to zero. Um, so he, he looks at small, it look, looks, looks at low temperature, but even there it's very challenging. I mean, so beta is very strange. We only know what happens at beta equals two. This is what, I, this is what my yeah. understanding is. Yes, beta equals two, you can compute everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. that's and, because and, it's determinable. And in 1D you can, because you have the sign beta, so you can start to express things fairly yeah. easily. But in 2D, um, I've never, I mean, there's all these papers by Ma Martin and Imbri and Lee. And what do they do? What do they say? I couldn't really read from them the, the correlation functions. It's like, it's not like you can mm -hmm. write also some rules and things. Yeah. I'm not, uh, but of course, once you go to, you know, even to, in two dimensions, even if you go to hard spheres, if you're not closely packed, we don't know very much about the system, right? If you don't look at, don't look at close packing and you look at it as a statistical uh, mechanics model, we don't know what correlations look like. Yeah, I think it's, so you have these methods of cluster expansions, right, that are accessible if, if beta is very small. But, uh, yeah, but I don't, that's a very high, that's a very, you know, low fugacity, that's very low density. But once you get to high density where you're nearly fully packed, then we don't know anything as far as I know. Unless it's fully packed, in which case we know. But once you get away from there, we don't know anything. I agree. Yeah, there's much more that's not understood. Than yeah. Oh, yeah. There's <laughs> amazing. Sure. It's extraordinary what we don't know. Okay, I see that there's been a very lively conversation. Is there? Any other question that the audience would like to ask? Well, I just was curious to know about Klepsov. Uh, what did Klepsov do? I, I, I see you have 
his name down. What what kind of geometric stuff is involved there? So it's exactly this. Uh, uh, answer, when I answered Camilo's question, uh, expressing yeah. these coefficients in terms of the metric of the that you put on the manifold by uh, by these uh, Gaussian computations, you know. So uh, it's a, it's a free field computation, or is it a Liouville computation? What kind it's of a free field computation? Free field computation. Okay. And so he expresses everything with uh, in terms of the metric and. With, um, is, is it related? Is it related to Liouville at all or not? Yes. Yes. It so is. You see, okay. you see, you see Liouville as one of the terms. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's yeah it's it's one of the papers that you know on that topic that are the most uh, explicit and mathematical. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, if not, uh, thank you, Sylvia, again for the wonderful lecture. Thank you. And so have a nice afternoon, everybody, and um, a nice weekend. <laughs>